the Ateneo Alumni Association has evolved from its image of a boys club in the early years to the image of an active alumni association of men and women for others. I think it's very important to remember that the ally performs a very important education value. The education of our graduates ends not with graduation, but with their continuing practice in introduction into the legal world. This is a big task, but I believe everything is possible as long as you believe in our dear Lord. And as Athenian lawyers, we do believe, and with your help, we will be able to do it. Let us continue to be men and women for others. Join the Alliance. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us. The Ateneo Law Alumni Association has evolved from its image of a boys club in the early years to the image of an active alumni association 
of men and women for others. I think it's very important to remember that the ally performs a very important education value. The education of our graduates ends not with graduation, but with their continuing practice in introduction into the legal world. This is a big task, but I believe everything is possible as long as you believe in our dear Lord. And as Athenian lawyers, we do believe, and with your help, we will be able to do it. Let us continue to be men and women for others. Join the Alliance. Join us. Join us. Join us.
Good afternoon to all the viewers here at the Ateneo de Manila Law Alumni Association page. We welcome you all to the Father Joaquin G. Bernas e-lecture series. The Alai decided to name this project in honor of Father Bernas, the Dean Emeritus of the Ateneo Law School, because he led as he continues to lead our alma mater to its greatest heights and for his laudable accomplishments as a constitutionalist and amicus curiae of the Supreme Court. Father Bernas' deep analysis of legal issues moved decision makers in government, legal advocates, citizens and media, and us, his students, to take direct action on national issues. This project of the Alai is in keeping with Father Bernas' directive that the alumni should promote the passion for justice and advance legal education. The web lecture series was launched on this channel to allow Alai to reach an expanded audience, both alumni and non-alumni. Our goal was for our speakers not just to le lecture about the topic, but more importantly, to help the viewers understand new laws and jurisprudence and their effects on the actual practice of law. On behalf of the Ateneo Law Alumni Association, headed by our chairman, Teddy Cruz, and President Nena Rosales, allow me to formally open the seventh session in the series of web lectures now referred to as the Father Joaquin G. Bernas Lecture Series. Good afternoon again. I have the honor to introduce our guest speaker this afternoon. Our guest speaker is no stranger to the Ateneo Law Alumni Association Incorporated. Among his very extensive and impressive credentials, I would like to single out and boast that our guest speaker is a proud alumnus of the Ateneo School of Law, belonging to the class of 1986 and was among the top 15 in the 1986 bar exams. He is a member of the Alai and served as its treasurer and trustee from 2010 to 2016 until he was called to public service. A CPA lawyer, he is the first appointed Deputy Director General of the Anti-Red Tape Authority under the office of the President and assumed office on December 1, 2018. Prior to this, he was an Assistant Secretary of the Department of Trade and Industry concurrently leading the Consumer Protection Group and the DTI Steel Task Force. He likewise served as OIC Director of the Bureau of Philippine Standards, representing the Philippines in various conferences. He was a managing partner of E.V. Perez Law Office, excelling in both accounting and the practice of law. A distinguished Ilongo, he was the class valedictorian of the University of the Philippines in Visayas, where he also obtained his bachelor's degree in business administration with major in accountancy. He also served as the university's student council president. Our speaker is an active Rotarian, serving as past president of the Rotary Club of Makati Central and as assistant governor of District 3830. He also leads a small discipleship group at the Union Church of Manila. He is married to Dr. Maria Lucila Perez, a pediatrician, and is a proud father to three daughters, lawyer Esther Loren, Dr. Elizabeth Grace, and lost, uh, medical student Eleanor Angeli. Friends, let us all welcome Deputy Director General Ernesto V. Perez. Thank you very much, Attorney. Yes, it's good to see you again. Thank you, Attorney Kiko, for that kind but quite long introduction. <laughs> I try to keep it short, but your topic is very timely considering that um, business permits will be renewed soon and um, businesses are slowly opening. I will turn over the floor to you now, DDG Ness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Attorney Kiko, for this opportunity. Uh, thanks also to the Board of Trustees of the Ateneo Law Alumni Association, led by its chairman, uh, my good friend, Attorney Ted Cruz, and its president, uh, President Nena Legaspi. Uh, it's really an honor and a privilege to me to be invited as uh, your speaker. I don't consider myself as a guest because I, I feel that I'm at home with the Ateneo Law and it's always an honor, uh, an opportunity to serve, uh, to inform the public 
and share with you our knowledge about this good law, which we call uh, a game changer law, which is no other than the ease of doing business and efficient delivery of uh, government services law, which amended the Republic Act, or it's Republic Act 11032, which amended Republic Act 9485 or the Anti-Red Tape Act of 2007. Would you believe that there is an Anti-Red Tape Act as early as 2007? Honestly, I have to admit that uh, I did not know of this law until I, I joined the government uh, later with the DTI because this is a really a baby of the Department of Trade and Industry. So when we were discussing this in the management committee about this law and about the uh, signing and the need for um, uh, leaders, uh, and there's, so there was an opening for a director general and uh, three deputy directors general, I immediately applied because I think this is uh, seemed to me a very interesting uh, law. <clears throat> we were discussing it and uh, they were calling it as a really a game changer law because it requires a change in the mindset of people in government. Uh, whereas before, before this law, uh, people, when they go to government agencies, the employees or the official would treat these people as ordinary taxpayers, as if uh, you were giving them uh, a, something that is a, a, a privilege, something that's a favor. Uh, but actually, this law uh, it requires all government agencies to deal every people who are dealing with government to be treated as a, a VIP, because uh, it uh, it is true to the mandate that we in the public service uh, should uh, maintain that. Uh, uh, constitutional mandate at public office is a is a public trust. No, um, Republic Act 9484, when it was uh, uh, issued in 2007, used to be implemented by the Civil Service uh, Commission, but uh, nothing much really about it. Uh, perhaps it is more known for the enforcement of the uh, no uh, known break policy, but not a lot of people really knew about this uh, until. Uh, the president, uh, in his first State of the Nation address on July 26, 2016, where he said that reforms to uh, ensure uh, competitiveness and ease of doing business uh, uh, will be mandatory. So in about two years after that State of the Nation address, the department, all agencies led by the Department of uh, Trade and Industry lobbied with our Congress to propose uh, a draft of this law, and in about two years, this was uh, passed uh, by Congress, acting uh, with the, all the congressmen and uh, senators uh, crossing party lines to ensure that this is uh, uh, signed by the president in record time. So, uh, can we go to the first slide, please? Uh, the president reiterated again uh, after the issuance of the law in his uh, last uh, State of the Nation address in 2020, where he said that the ease of doing business and efficient government services delivery act are beginning to have gaining momentum. So he directed the, our office together with the DILG, the uh, Department of Budget and Management, along with the other agencies to to ensure that. Uh, all possible uh, services issued by uh, rendered by government are done in a streamlined and simplified um, process. No? Um, Republic Act 11032 was issued to amend uh, one Republic Act 9485 to get even more fit uh, and um, creating a dedicated body under the office of the president, which is called the Anti Red Tape uh, Authority, which provides really for. Uh, 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 strict violation provisions for strict violations of the law and stiff penalties uh, in case of violations. And it created the anti red tape authority to implement the, the law uh, and also to take over the functions from the Civil Service Commission. Although, of course, the anti red tape authority, when it receives complaints, it investigates, conducts hearings, and um, recommends its findings and recommendation to either the Civil Service Commission or to the Office of the Ombudsman. If it involves purely administrative uh, concern, it uh, is referred to the Civil Service Commission. But if it involves uh, both criminal and administrative, it is referred to the 
office of the president. And, and next slide, please. Actually, you know, um, what prompted the Department of Trade and Industry to lobby really for this law is not only the usual uh, statements from the president that um, uh, he does not want people to be burdened with the uh, uh, streamlined with the processes and procedures, and he was uh, relating his experience when he was uh, mayor of Davao, and he made sure that dapat uh, magsila yung pila at hindi dapat pinapahirapan ang taong bayan. And also over the years, our country has been suffering from uh, a poor uh, ranking by the World Bank uh, doing business survey. As you know, uh, if you would like to attract investors, investors look at the competitiveness and doing business ranking of the country to ensure that once it invests, uh, it, it, its investments are, are also duly protected and it is assured of a fair return of its investments. So next slide, please. As you can see from the slide, we were we are, we are really faring poorly compared with uh, uh, even our neighbors in the ASEAN countries. In terms of uh, doing business, we were ranked number eight out of the 10 ASEAN countries. We're slightly ahead only of uh, uh, Cambodia and uh, Myanmar and even Laos. Uh, yeah. If we if we do not uh, step up our efforts, we will probably be overtaken by even Laos. We have long been overtaken by Vietnam in terms of uh, doing business. Last to 2019 uh, doing business uh, result, we were ranked 124 out of uh, 190 economies. Can you imagine that? And then uh, uh, one year after, in 2020, during the 2020 re result, our ranking improved by being uh, ranked uh, 95 out of uh, the uh, 190 economies. So this is a slight increase. Uh, but in terms of uh, improvement, there is really much need for improvement. But because while we are trying to uh, do uh, institutional reforms, other countries are also uh, doing their best, best to improve their ranking. In terms of competitiveness, we are also way, way behind other countries and also from our ASEAN countries. Of course, we do not compare with uh, uh, Singapore because Singapore is always number one or, or number one or number two. We are way beyond behind uh, Malaysia, which is ranked uh, number 15. I remember during my visit to official visit to Malaysia uh, two years ago when I was officer in charge of the Bureau of Philippine Standards, my counterpart then uh, narrated to me that uh, in the late uh, 87, he was sent by his government to study in UP. And so in the late 87 or 88, he noticed that we were LRT. Uh, in Malaysia, they had no LRT then. And then uh, he noticed that offices already had uh, computers. In Malaysia, they did not have it then. But look at Malaysia now. It's really, well, really way, well behind Malaysia in terms of their uh, transportation, rails, etc. In terms of uh, automation, we are also way behind. So the efforts of the DTI, and then we have taken over the function from the DTI uh, in terms of improving our ranking, uh, most more particularly in terms of uh, doing business as well as in the competitiveness. We hope that by next year, when the survey comes out, uh, I don't know in, in view of the pandemic, the survey has been suspended, but uh, we have. Uh, made uh, so much improvements already in terms of the 11 indicators, which I will discuss with you later on. Next slide, please. Tapon, I mentioned that already, you know, 95. Our latest ranking is 95 out of uh, 190 economies or countries in the world. Next slide. These are the indicators being used. No? In terms of... Uh, 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 dealing with construction permits, we improve a bit by plus nine. Uh, you, there you, uh, for you who are practicing in the construction industry, dealing with the uh, uh, construction industry associated in the Philippines in terms of ranking, you'd probably be experiencing some uh, difficulties in terms of uh, getting your uh, uh, construction permits. No, uh, not anymore. I think now they have started to uh, computerize and. Uh, 
streamline or automate their processes. But in case you have any problem at all, uh, you report it to us and the authority and we'll do something about it. In terms of getting credit, we also had a significant uh, improvement. In terms of uh, protecting minority, yes, we improved by 60. It is in the uh, getting electricity. Well, of course, we have um, uh, improved, although we uh, a bit uh, uh, suffered a decline. Still, we are much better in terms of uh, getting electricity. It is really with uh, 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 starting a business now where we also suffered uh, a decline of five notches uh, and also trading across borders, etc. But later on, I will discuss with you that it's now easier and simpler uh, to get your uh, business permits. And if you have issues at all, problems, you, you let me know later on. Next slide, please. So uh, Republic Act 11032 is a game changer. It was signed by the president on May 28, 2018, became effective on June 17, 2018, uh, two weeks after its publication. And then uh, it, uh, uh, with the, I was the first to be appointed uh, employee of the entire Deputy Authority. Uh, I, I assumed office as uh, Deputy Director General on December 1, 2018, and uh, became its officer in charge on December 18, 2018, uh, thanks to our uh, alumnus, Attorney Rico Bernabe, uh, Brad, uh, Attorney Tejo, he helped me to be inducted by. Uh, I took my office before Executive Secretary Medjaldea on December, you know, on November 25, 2018, and I assume office on December 1, 2018. My work as um, officer in charge of the authority is to prepare the ground works, no? prepare the budget, uh, prepare the implementing rules and regulations, uh, prepare the plantilla positions, uh, get the, uh, its approval from, at least prepare, prepare the draft so that. Uh, with the appointment of the regular uh, director general who has the rank of a secretary. Actually, the three deputy directors have the rank of an undersecretary of, a, of an agency. So with the appointment of the regular director general and his assumption to office on uh, uh, July 9, uh, 2019, uh, one week after the implementing rules and regulations were signed uh, both by the uh, chairman of the, well, together with the civil chairman of the Civil Service Commission and the secretary of the Department of Trade and Industry, because that is what the law provides that for the implementing rules to be issued, it has to be signed uh, not only by the director general of the anti red Tape Authority, but also by the secretary of trade and industry who also acts as the chairman of the uh, ease of doing business and anti red tape advisory council composed of uh, the Secretary of State as the chair, uh, with the Director General of the anti Tip Authority as the vice chair, and with five members, the Secretary of the uh, Department of Finance, Secretary of the Department of Information and Communications Technology, Secretary of the DILG, uh, and two members of the private sector, as private sector representatives. We have a proposal to increase the membership <clears throat> to include the Director General of the NEDA, as well as the Secretary of the DBM to really give it a, a broader perspective. Next slide, please. Next slide, okay. Um, what is the mandate of the authority? Mandate of the authority is to ensure that the processes and requirements of government agencies are simplified and streamlined to reduce uh, red tape and, of course, the basic function is to expedite business and non-business related transactions and government. So it's so broad, no? It covers not only business, meaning those frontline uh, services being offered by government agencies, but also those back-end services like issuance of certifications, uh, requests, uh, answers to uh, queries, etc. Not only the, the Salongal law uh, requires that government agencies, particularly its agency head or the concerned government uh, employer official must respond to a, a request for assistance or query within 15 days from receipt. The law uh, under this uh, uh, provision 
also requires that uh, you are held accountable by Republic Act 11032 if you do not answer a complaint or answer query or question within uh, uh, the standard processing time, which I will discuss with you later on. As provided for in uh, Section 17, it provides for the creation of the anti-Red Tape Authority uh, headed by a Director General who has the rank of a Secretary and three Deputy Directors General with the rank of Undersecretary, uh, Deputy Director General for Finance and Administration, uh, Deputy Undersecretary uh, or uh, direct Deputy Director General for Legal, which is the position that I hold, and uh, the Deputy Director General for Operation, which is still uh, vacant no more, to be filled up by by the president, we're still waiting for the appointment. Okay. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the coverage. The coverage is so broad. No? It covers all government offices and agencies, including actually the uh, law uh, they did not provide for that it is limited to executive department. The law only says. All government offices and agencies, including local government units, government-owned or controlled corporations, and other government instrumentalities located in the Philippines or abroad that provide services covering business-related and non-business-related uh, transactions. In the uh, signing of the implementing rules and regulations, somebody inserted, nasingitan kami, somebody inserted the executive department. Uh, in the implementing rules and regulations. That is probably because um, they, those belonging to the constitutional bodies like, uh, or, uh, like the uh, Civil Service Commission, <clears throat> the Office of the Ombudsman, the Commission on Audit, <clears throat> they are not supposed to be covered in view of the separation of powers and also the, the legislative and the uh, judicial branches of government are not supposedly covered in view of the separation of powers but we have uh, we are in close dealings with um, or uh, in close contact with uh, with the supreme court and with the uh, uh, house of representatives and the senate and we have offered our services in terms of uh, conducting trainings for their staff especially for the uh, administrative staff of the supreme court and the legislative staff of the uh, both houses of congress to train them in terms of uh, regulatory impact assessment. Uh, I will tell you in detail what a regulatory impact assessment uh, is all about, and they're open to this. And uh, even, even if strictly they're not covered by the law, uh, they we were informed that they will be creating their own uh, unit as anti-red tape unit in their own respective uh, offices. This will also ensure that uh, their processes are streamlined. Huh. So next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, the mandate of ARTA is actually twofold. No? Uh, the empowerment, that means uh, capacitating and enabling agencies to comply with the requirements of the law, particularly on their streamlining and uh, re-engineering, because the law requires all agencies not only to, to streamline their processes, but also to automate. But of course, before we, they should automate, they need to uh, streamline otherwise, as we said, para you know, automate din natin yung red tape. But if they, if you require them to automate without requiring them to uh, streamlining their processes. Of course, in case of violations, kasi marami pa rin uh, matitigas ang ulo sa gobyerno until now, no? uh, uh, we have the enforcement power meaning that uh, we receive complaint, even if we do not receive complaint, we also investigate uh, moto proprio. Uh, we investigate and then we um, recommend um, our findings to either the civil service or the office of the ombudsman. There's a pending bill uh, in, uh, houses, in the House of Representatives and in uh, the Senate um, to expand the powers of, of ARTA. And uh, our recommendation is uh, to enable us to conduct uh, our investigation and that investigation should be given due weight by the, either the Civil Service Commission or the Office of the Ombudsman because what's happening now after our our recommendations, the Civil Service Commission and the Office of the Ombudsman conducts another investigation. They say, 
although they say that they respect our findings and recommendation, but due process requires that they will also have to uh, conduct a separate investigation. I do not know um, if uh, the bill is amended, expanding the powers of uh, the ARTA, not only in terms of uh, making its recommendation for agencies to uh, uh, revise or improve their regulations, because under the law now, if we find that uh, an existing regulation is uh, too burdensome uh, and too costly and there's no justification, part of our, uh, the anti red authority is only empowered to recommend uh, its revision or repeal after undergoing uh, a process called uh, regulatory review. We do not have uh, the power to compel the agencies to uh, uh, reverse or set aside a questionable uh, regulation. Although, of course, there's an initiative uh, started by the Department of Trade and Industry, which function has been turned over to the anti red Authority, we, we call Project Repeal. And this is, uh, of course, incorporated also in the law, which requires all government agencies to uh, make an inventory of the laws and regulations that they're implementing and uh, determine whether these uh, laws and uh, regulations are still attuned with the time and whether these laws uh, do not have the proper justification anymore or they're causing undue uh, regulatory burden or cost. So that therefore they should recommend uh, their repeal, revisions or amendments, uh, etc. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Tell me kung medyo mahaba. All right. Uh, the empowerment, empowerment of our enforcement function. Uh, just to uh, uh, get a break, meron tayong uh, um, konting uh, video presentation. May iksi lang naman ito. Pangarap ng batas na ito na maalis na ang red tape at korupsyon upang tuluyan ang mapabilis ang mga proseso ng gobyerno. Upang makamit ito, may dalawang landas na sabay na tatahaki ng ARTA. Nandito ang empowerment at enforcement. Una ay ang empowerment, kung saan bibigyan ng tulong at kapasidad ang mga ahensya ng gobyerno para mas streamline, ma-re-engineer at maiangat nila ang kalidad ng kanilang serbisyo. Tulad ng regulatory impact assessment, kung saan ang mga proposed na proseso ay sinisiguradong may progressive na effect. At ang regulatory management ang proseso ng mga ahensya sa pamamagitan ng pagsigurado ng ating mga regulasyon, batas at polisiya ay dumaan sa masusing pag-aaral. Ang pangalawa ay ang enforcement, kung saan ang mga ahensya na lalabag sa batas ng ARTA ay papatawan ng naaayon na kaparusahan. Guided by these two pillars, our gift of productivity and efficiency to the people will be just a step away. Approve ka, ARTA! All right. On the empowerment side of uh, the mandate of the anti red Authority, I'd like to emphasize that under Section 5 of the law, it requires all offices and agencies uh, which provide government uh, services to regularly conduct or undertake cost compliance analysis, time and motion studies, and to undergo evaluation and improvement of their transaction systems and procedure. No? The anti red Authority is also uh, mandated to coordinate with all the government agencies no, to uh, review all, to sabi ko na yung project repeal before, to review all existing laws, executive issuances, and or local ordinances, and recommend the repeal if the same are deemed outdated, uh, redundant, and un adds undue regulatory burden to the transacting public. So there you go. As lawyers, I really urge you if you're encountering problems with a particular agency, and if you find a particular regulation of that agency uh, too burdensome and no longer attuned uh, or probably redundant with the uh, other section five of the law uh, mandates that agency to recommend its uh, 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 that it recommend its revision uh, and uh, review, no, and possible uh, if it's a law, possible repeal. It's if it's uh, regulation, review, and uh, reversal or uh, revisions. No? And uh, that is required by the law, uh, Section 5. Um, we also have uh, a, a program called the uh, Regulatory Impact Assessment. This is actually a management tools 
and we are being guided and assisted by the UP uh, University of the Philippines uh, College of uh, Public Administration uh, with a funding from the US uh, AID, uh, which uh, headed by Dr. Gilbert Lianto, who made a study in 2015 uh, when he was uh, uh, chair of the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. This is a, a government think tank now, where they observed that the Philippines is suffering from a lack of a formal regulatory system and that agencies are working in silos. With this law, that's no longer possible. Uh, uh, all agencies uh, under the, uh, the mandate of the anti rentative authority are mandated to interconnect. So we have that initiative to gather all agencies uh, to a consulting meetings to ensure that no regulation or no particular law is uh, redundant or burdensome to the public. No? Um, and number two, we also have a uh, program, Nehemiah. Uh, this is a streamlining process. Uh, uh, your, uh, well, it, it comes from it, its inspiration uh, from the Old Testament and the on, on uh, Prophet Nehemiah, where he built uh, the walls, the security wall of uh, Israel within uh, 52 days. And the people at the time were laughing at him. No? Uh, it was impossible to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. So a uh, program Nehemiah, uh, when we presented this to the president during a cabinet meeting on April, uh, on March 2, 2020, uh, he readily approved it right there and then. Uh, this program, uh, will ensure that uh, go identified agencies no, will uh, undergo streamlining process and to uh, cut their processes and procedure within uh, uh, a period, a minimum period of 50 days from the launching. And uh, within 52 weeks, meaning a little over a year, the processes and procedure are actually put into uh, writing. No? And uh, this is now uh, not only an option, but it's already a uh, a directive from the president, as you will know later on, uh, when he issued Administrative Order uh, 23 uh, recently, on just before the uh, pandemic, on February 2020, 2020, where he directed all government agencies to streamline, not, not only to follow Republic Act 11032, but particularly directing them to streamline their processes and to justify the existence of the law or regulation uh, that they are implementing and recommend its repeal or revision if they find it burdensome, meaning it's causing undue regulatory burden or cost to the public. And they were given a deadline. No? Uh, because of the pandemic, we asked for a extension of the deadline uh, and the pre Office of the President granted us a deadline or until July 25, uh, 2020 no? to submit to us the report to the, their compliance to Administrative Order 23 and their updated citizen charter. Uh, I will tell you later on what the citizen charter is all about. To me, when you deal with a government agency, the first thing that you have to do is look at its citizen charter. To me, this is really the heart and soul of the law. Uh, the citizen charter is a document, but a contract between that government agency and the transacting public, which uh, requires government agencies to publish uh, the requirements to, to publish the list of uh, the services that they offer, offer to the public, including the list of requirements, meaning the documentary requirements uh, for that particular service, uh, the cost to be paid, the person authorized uh, to handle the transaction, um, the standard processing time uh, to process the application or request, and many others which I will discuss later. And if a particular uh, process is not listed in the citizen charter, that is considered a violation. For us, if they impose an additional requirement or cost on top of what is published in their citizen charter, that is already clearly a violation under the law. But if they do not publish their citizen charter or they do not even comply with the citizen charter requirement, our direct to presume that what they require is in violation of the citizen charter, then we will file charges against them. No. And we're very serious about this. Also, the 
another empowerment aspect is the yung national business one stop shop no where when you deal with an agency you are supposed to be only being uh, uh, received uh, in a uh, one window single window uh, one under one roof well all the services will already be there that there is no more need for you to transfer from one office or another uh, we started this with uh, uh, securing a yung business permit you no longer had to get a have to get a separate uh, barangay clearance from your barangay uh, you can get your barangay clearance from the city or municipality where you are applying your business permit or uh, we, we also have this initiative and uh, of uh, getting also your uh, building permit your um, bir certificate your uh, uh, sss uh, field health and pagibig also under one roof because they're supposed to be already interconnected you now once you get your um, we have this program called the uh, yung, uh, yung boss starting only with the physical and boss pa lang, para na. but once the uh, central business portal is uh, is uh, created or perfected ano na, all agencies will be interconnected no uh, using the digital format but we have already had a, a soft launch of the uh, business one stop shop with the sec alam ko you had that problems with the uh, SEC getting your uh, certificate of registration no? kasi nag breakdown yung kanila system but if you try uh, registering a, a one person corporation uh, they tell us na dapat in less than a day you will already get your uh, certificate of registration if you have encounter problem you let us know you complain to us and uh, we'll call the attention of the SEC on that and also at the same time, you will not only get your uh, certificate of registration in one day, you will also get your uh, BIR registration, your SSS registration, your PhilHealth registration, Pag-ibig in one day. Because this is you know, supposed to be uh, connected already. When you file your application for uh, registration of your articles of incorporation with the SEC, physical pa lang kasi pa perfected yung central business portal, uh, you do it physically with the SEC, but you only go to SEC in one day. And once your documents are complete, uh, they will be processed and approved uh, within the day. Of course, in the enforcement uh, side of the mandate of ARTA, we issue orders of automatic approval. Now, what is an order of automatic approval? Later on, I will discuss that. When you submit your application and you have, your, you have been issued an acknowledgement receipt or official receipt which is an evidence that you have submitted your application complete with all the requirements and the fees have been paid that agency is mandated to process it within the standard processing time and if it is not processed within that standard processing time the law says it should be deemed automatically approved i will go to the details later on so of course if, if there's a violation we receive a complaint or we investigate motu proprio we make our findings and recommend we file cases with the office of the ombudsman or the civil service commission or with the office of the president okay also we handle concerns inquiries and complaints pag mayroong mga issue on uh, burdensome regulation subject to regulatory review we call the attention of that agency we call them to a meeting together with the complainant or private stakeholder and then together we discuss the issues and then we make recommendations we call that uh, regulatory review you know, uh, the Philippines is probably the only country, if one, uh, if not the one of the few countries, which make mandatory uh, the adoption of good regulatory practice uh, with the uh, implementation of Republic Act 110382. In other countries, this is more voluntary. But of course, in the Philippines, you know, it is uh, mandatory. Na nga, nagkaka problema pa rin tayo. But um, of course, that is uh, um, expected because. Uh, we are just uh, uh, barely two years in the implementation of the law. Uh, and we are gaining momentum, uh, as the president has noted in his last uh, State of the Nation address. Next slide, please. So now, uh, as I discussed earlier, in salient points of the law, the Citizen Charter provided for under uh, section uh, 6 of Republic Act 11032, as I said, is a document no, required for all government agencies to be published in their website 
or in the most conspicuous place in their offices or in handbook or in um, uh, tarpaulin in the in their frontline offices the the a comprehensive and uh, uh, uniform checklist of requirements for each type of application or request no and then the procedure to obtain a particular person uh, service the person responsible for that service the documents to be filed the fees to be paid uh, and uh, the provision for uh, filing complaints of course parang embodied na rin do as i said when you deal with an agency if you're a prospective investor you look at the website of that agency or if they don't have a website yet if you go to their offices you must first look into their citizen charter because it is mandated by law that is supposed to be posted in their frontline services in terms of uh sa kanilang camera or sa tarpaulin or sa sa standi no uh, the citizen charter if they do not have the citizen charter they are already uh, held liable and under section 8 of uh, republic 8 uh, republic act 11032 the head of agency is accountable uh, for the uh, implementation of the law so if they fail to submit or provide for their citizen charter the head of agency can be the subject of a complaint so when we file our complaint we include the head of agency as high as the department of uh, department secretary Prescribed processing time. The law provides for a standard processing time of 3, 7, 20 working days to process your application or request. If uh, the application or request um, is um, what you call this, um, uh, does not require uh, some uh, discretion on the part of agency because it is only uh, uh, what is, uh, simple, uh, the law considers that a as a simple transaction, um, it does not require some discretion, kundi parang ano lang, no? uh, uh, intimately related to their function, uh, ministerial on their part to act on the application. The law provides only for a max of period of uh, three working days. If it requires some discretion, no? uh, the law provides for a longer period of seven working days. If it has implication to health, safety, or requires some testing, the law provides for a longer period of 20 working days, subject only to a one-time extension. Now, if your application is not processed or you're not notified of the action or request, then that person, that government employee, including the supervisor and the head, will already be the subject, proper subject of a complaint no there's no more need for you to make a follow up kagaya to no uh, usual sa ating mga filipinos when we deal with the government agency you ask if your friend if you know he know he or she knows somebody from that agency no, no longer true no longer required under under this law because uh, the law specifically provides that if your application is not acted upon within the standard processing time of 3 7 20 working days the law already considers that automatic, automatically approved. And in the implementing rules, we pr provided for a simple mechanism. Mechanism. All you have to do is uh, write ARTA, email your concern or complaint that this particular agency has failed to process your application within the standard processing time, with evidence, of course, of completeness of your uh, submission of your requirements and the fees of your uh, of course, after proper determination, with probably one clarificatory hearing, uh, we will make uh, will issue a what we call a certificate of completeness to that agency, uh, directing the agency to uh, automatically issue the application if it is an original application or automatic approve uh, renewal if it is a renewal. Of course, uh, if it, the agent does not heed it, or whether he heeds it or not. That is already considered a violation of the law. Now, so related to this is the uh, zero contact policy. It is prohibited prohibited for any government uh, official or employee who has a pending application or request to have any contact or dealing with the applicant, except only in three circumstances. Huh? One, 
when he actually when the applicant files the application physically because the filing can be done online no? or when he uh, pays the fees which he can also do online or when there is a need for clarification or meeting in which case the meeting or clarification should be done um, on record and officially if he does that if you have an employee or visa has any con makes any contact with you the law says it's already a violation of the uh, zero contact policy of the law and uh, that is already subject to uh, prosecution this is one stop shop i already uh, uh, mentioned that earlier two strike policy because uh, for the first offense uh, the penalty is six months suspension for the second offense ito na, um, dismissal from service including uh, forfeiture of benefits uh, a perpetual disqualification from service fine of 500,000 pesos to 2 million pesos and imprisonment of uh, six months to uh, two years okay next slide please Next slide. Next slide, Jeb. All right, uh, let's take a break. Ano nga ba o ease of... Ano nga ba ang Citizens Charter? Ayon sa RA11032, o Ease of Doing Business and Government Service Delivery Act of 2018, ang Citizens Charter o kilala rin sa tawag ng gabay ng mamamayan ay ang opisyal na dokumento ng government agencies na nagsisilbing listahan ng lahat ng uri ng serbisyo at mga prosesong may kinalaman dito. Sinisigurado nito ang compliance ng lahat ng government agencies at mga departamento nito mula sa national, regional, provincial at field offices. Kasama na ang local government units hanggang sa barangay level. Sa cloud din ito ang mga pampublikong ospital, state universities at mga government-owned corporation, corporations o GOCC. Is red authority na siyang tagapagpatupad ng EODB law ay naglabas ng memorandum circular na nagtatalay ng recommended template and guidelines sa tamang pagsulat ng citizen's charter. Ano nga ba ang nakasanayin dash 002? Nirarapat nito na madali ang ma-access ng publiko ang citizen's charter sa pamamagitan ng handbooks at information materials na nakadisplay sa tarpaulins TV at kiosk. Ito ay dapat nilalagay sa pinakabulwagan ng tanggapan o sa mga lugar kung saan pinakamadaling makita ng publiko. Kaya naman, ito ay dapat nakalagay sa pintana ng transaction window at naka-upload din sa website ng tanggapan. Bilang ang citizen starter ay isa sa mandato ng RA11032, ang Section 22 ng Batas ay tinatakda na maaaring kasuhan ng administrative liability ang hindi susunod dito. Ito ay maaaring maging sanhi ng suspension ng anim na buwan o kaya ay habang buhay na pagkatanggal sa trabaho at retirement benefits. Para sa mas marami pang impormasyon, pumunta lamang sa aming website at basahin ang ARTA MC No. 2019-002 ARTA MC No. 2019-002-A, Reference B, and Reference C. Upang ma-access ang inirekomendang template ng ARTA, i-enter at mag-download sa bit.ly slash citizens charter template. Ano nga ba? Okay. So as I said earlier, no, the citizens charter is really a uh, critical component of the law. Uh, this is where you really go. This is where you really ver verify uh, and look into when you deal with a particular agency. No? Because uh, in, even in our case, when we are, when our attention is called to a particular service being rendered by the agency, uh, the first thing that we do is we look at their citizen charter. Uh, in, in the coverage of the law, are covers more than 10,000 government agencies. Uh, hindi pa kasama yung mga barangay dyan. 
can you imagine the the agencies that were were trying we try to monitor um yung compliance pa lang nito mga about 60% eh. so for those which uh, uh fail to comply uh we are sending them uh, we have started uh to send them the notice of warning ang next step don if they do not submit we will also be filing already be filing uh, cases before the office of the ombudsman or the civil service commission depending on their salary grade kasi pag salary grade 26 and above office of the ombudsman yan but below that uh, civil service commission lang kasi yung mga salary grade 26 and above ito yung mga presidential appointees all right so it, uh, in other words just a review and citizens charter provides for a, that document no uh, it's a requirement for every agency that needs to be that need to publish that in their uh, website or in their uh, uh, frontline offices uh, the, the checklist of requirements the procedure of services the person responsible for each step the maximum time sabi ko yung standard processing time of 3720 and the documents required the amount is to be paid and the feedback mechanism basic to this requirement is that if the government agency or the employer dealing with imposes a requirement which is more than or on top of what is provided for in the checklist of requirements or imposing a, a fee or cost that is not provided for in the sin charter the law says it's already considered a violation okay, a very important point on citizen charter in in your uh, dealing with government and in our case as uh, uh, public servants because uh, it is a requirement for us any government agency is mandated to submit its updated citizens charter based on the guidelines issued by uh, the R anti rental authority and that deadline fell on uh, uh, july 25 2020. we are now in the process of evaluation monitoring and uh, looking for and uh, uh, the extent of compliance by the government agencies so those agencies which fail to comply they will be receiving in fact some of them have already received their, uh, our notices of warning uh, that is a uh, requirement of due process before we do that and if they still fail to submit the updated citizen charter we will immediately file charges against them next slide please i already discussed yung, sabi ko, yung prescribed processing time under uh, section uh, nine of uh, uh, of the law uh, and even in the implementing rules and regulations. The law um, requires all agencies to classify their transactions into either simple, complex, or highly technical. Simple, pag ministerial on the part of agency to process three working days. Complex, it requires some discretion, some evaluation, seven working days. Highly technical because it has implication to life, uh, safety, public health, requires some testing, etc. 20 working days subject only to one extension. And also, if uh, there is a need for an extension, the concerned government uh, employee ma is mandated, required to notify the applicant of the need for, an, uh, for the extension. And if also, if your application or request is denied, the agency is also mandated to provide for the ground or the reason for uh disapproval otherwise this is already considered a violation and we have filed charges before the ombudsman and before the civil service commission for those we found uh, violating uh, the law failure to process the application within the standard processing time uh, that is considered a violation of the law which uh, um, is uh, subject to penalties, state penalties already. Uh, next slide, please. All right. Ito po yung uh, mentioned earlier about automatic approval, that there's no need for you to follow up uh, in view of the zero contact policy because uh, the agency is mandated to process your application within the standard processing time of 3720. Otherwise, uh, uh, the law says it's deemed automatically approved and what is the procedure under section 10 of uh, 
Republic Act uh, 11032 or the implementing rules under uh, Section 4, uh, Rule 8. Um, upon a complaint <coughs> with the Ontario Top Authority by either by email or by uh, <coughs> uh, snail mail, uh, just a proof that <coughs> you have submitted your application complete with uh, all the requirements and fees uh, being paid as evidenced by an acknowledgement receipt or an official receipt and that the agency failed to process that within the uh, standard processing time of 3720. Then what we'll do after due investigation, we will issue a uh, automatic approval order with a certificate of completeness from the applicant or from our evaluation. And, uh, early on, we had done that with the Land Transportation Franchising Regulatory Board. We have uh, issued that to the Food and Drug Administration. We have issued that to the Department of Public Works and Highways on pending applications which have not been acted upon with the processing period. Uh, we noted that uh, the FDA and the LTFRB have complied with the automatic approval order. Some um, uh, tried to question our, because they claim that they are not covered because it is performing a quasi-judicial function. Well, of course, I have to clarify this, I forgot. No? Even agencies performing quasi-judicial functions are covered by the law because we look into the deliberations uh, by Congress when this law was being crafted. The intention really is to uh, cover them because in the old law, Republic Act 9485, it specifically provided for an exem the exemption of those performing quasi-judicial uh, uh, functions. Under this law, that exemption was deleted. So the intent really was to cover those agencies performing quasi-judicial function. And the author of the law, no less than Senator Mig Subiri, is very emphatic about it because he was, he really sponsored this law based on his experience when he uh, was not, when he was, went into a private business when, uh, hindi na senator, and he tried to apply for a business permit. Can you imagine? He was really, uh, telling us two years and people knew him to be a former congressman, former senator, and yet they were making it difficult for him to get his uh, uh, approval for his business application. So when he went back to the Senate, he made sure that uh, to sponsor this law and in record time, uh, this law was passed. So ito po yung, I, I understand your feeling no? when you're probably helping or assisting a client uh, who is having a hard time. Uh, getting the approval, uh, especially pala, uh, uh, even uh, Sangunian Bayan uh, are covered because local government units are are covered by the law. Ba? Yung, may mga problema kayo like, uh, to get a uh, permit or license requiring uh, a resolution or approval from the Sangunian Panaliwigan, Sangunian Bayan, Sangunian Panglusod. Usually, ang problema doon, walang quorum, uh, absent yung presiding officer. Not anymore under the law, because under the law, they are given a uh, maximum period of four, 45 working days and a one-time extension of 20 days under Section 9 of the law. Otherwise, it is also subject to automatic approval. Okay. Next slide, please. Oh, so, by way of example, no, we have issued the... Uh, automatic approval orders to various agencies like LTFRB, FDA, National Telecommunication Commission, DNR, LGU. Uh, wala pang jurisprudence uh, in this case, but hopefully we will have one because uh, when we issued an automatic approval order to the uh, Department of Public Works and Highways, uh, Department Under Secretary filed a petition for certiorari under Rule 65 with the Court of Appeals uh, contending that uh, it is not covered by the law. Um, also, we have issued an automatic approval order to the National, Telecommunication, National Telecommunications Commission uh, for an automatic approval of a pending application for a license to operate by a uh, radio television company, uh, finding the requirements to have been submitted uh, uh, completely and uh, beyond the standard processing time, we issued an automatic approval order. Uh, and uh, what the NTC did, um, it elevated the 
concern to the Department of uh, Justice. Uh, uh, this case involving between agencies. So we're opposing it. We're saying that uh, the, our mandate is very specific under uh, uh, automatic approval order. And the law provides for no exception because uh, even those performing quasi judicial functions are covered. In the um, amendment to the law, we have also sought the expansion of our powers. No, para, and we have also um, opened this up with the president. Uh, uh, just to just an aside, uh, three weeks ago, we were called by the president to a meeting in Malacanang, just the three of us, the director general, the two of us, uh, the deputy director general. And his directive to us is to never hesitate to investigate and file cases because he will be completely behind us to support us and uh, to tell us not to uh, fear not to but to be just persistent in in investigating and filing cases so that is our mandate no less than from the office of the president so you see we have filed cases against a governor against a mayor even against the register of deeds of davao uh, for violating the uh, no lunch break policy uh, we were in Davao before the pandemic, and uh, the first agency that we did just beside the city hall was the register of deeds. No? Imagine uh, at about, two, we were there, we were interviewing the uh, an employee, and suddenly the cashier uh, made a sign uh, on lunch break. <laughs> so she probably noticed that we were surprised. She immediately went back 30 minutes after, but everything was recorded. So when we went back to the office, we immediately filed a complaint uh, against her before the office of the ombudsman. So ganun po kami ka serious. Even now, uh, uh, we have filed a case against uh, a uh, ito ka, yung latest, uh, kung pala ito, uh, barangay chairman. Ito naman, barangay chairman, mm, you know, when he issued a, before he issues a barangay clearance, he required uh, an applicant to secure a homeowner's uh, certification. So the uh, applicant complained, why am I being required to uh, get a homeowner certification? You know, when you live in a village, for example, before they will issue you a homeowner certification, you are required to update your fees. But the complaint says, this is not provided for in the citizen's charter. And why about those, what about those residing outside the, uh, a village? Why are they not being required uh, similarly, so when we look at the citizen charter, it is not actually provided for. The barangay chairman alleges that uh, there's a barangay ordinance which uh, authorizes that, that requirement. He said that uh, uh, regardless, uh, we, we, you are in violation, you are imposing a requirement that is not published in your citizen charter. Before, Therefore, we, filed, we recently filed a case against him with the office of the ombudsman. So continuing, so uh, uh, three weeks ago, um, we we also have uh, we do surveillance activity, this uh, discrete uh, uh, conduct uh, investigations. Now, uh, the register of deeds of Kanamba, medyo notorious to for uh, imposing yung ano uh, cut off, kasi under the law bawal po yung cut off. Ah, uh, they say that if they only uh, will have a quota of fifty applica applications a day. So when that quota is met by, say, 11 o'clock or even 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock, they stop. And worse, uh, they, do, they, have, uh, they have this uh, lunch break. No? So we sent our investigators, we filmed. And so with that evidence, we immediately filed. Wala nang uh, clarificatory hearing because they were caught in flagrante delicto. We immediately filed a case uh, with the Office of the Ombudsman for violation of the La, no lunch break policy. Yung complaints about uh, cut off, uh, walang evidence because nobody came out in the of, of pen to complain. So what we did is just uh, just file a case for violation of the zero contact policy. Because the law provides that it is illegal or improper for the agent not to accept an application or request within office hours. For as long as the applicant is within the premises, within the office hours, ready to complete, ready to file his application complete with the, all the requirements and ready to pay his fees, 
that application has to be accepted. Otherwise, that is will already that will already be considered a violation of the law. Next slide, please. Ayun, uh, under Section 5, uh, re-engineering of systems and procedure is no longer an option, but mandatory for all government agencies. So they are required to re-engineer and using the whole of government approach, using such tools as uh, cost compliance analysis, uh, time and motion studies, undergo evaluation and improvement of their systems and procedure. The objective being nothing but to improve their services to the public. They are also mandated under to review and repeal outdated laws and regulations and to, uh, that are causing undue regulatory burden. And third, uh, government must undertake so a regulatory impact assessment when introducing major. What's a regulatory impact assessment? It's a management tool which simply mandates that all agencies that they, before they uh, issue a particular regulation that is subjected to a regulatory uh, impact assessment, which in layman's term would mean that that regulation does not impose undue burden or undue cost to the public. Meron pong policies or guidelines that will be issued shortly by the Anti-Red Dep Authority uh, with the assistance of the UP uh, Public uh, College of Public Assistance, the Project Respond Group nila under the team of Dr. Gilbert Lianto, na all even uh, existing regulations have to be subjected to regulatory impact assessment. Meron pong mga question, set of questions that need to be answered by uh, agency. Uh, meron ding cost compliance analysis, pati yung filing fees, yung cost have to, have to be subjected to study to ensure that that cost or fee is reasonable and not causing undue regulatory burden to the transacting public. Otherwise, upon finding by ARTA, you know, after uh, ARTA will recommend that for that agency to uh, reconsider, uh, repeal, or revise the existing regulation that they are implementing. Under the law, um, the power of ARTA is just recommendatory. We do hope that in the amendatory bill, uh, the law will be amended to the effect that the uh, recommendations of ARTA will be given more weight, meaning that the agency will be compelled or mandated to follow the recommendation of ARTA in terms of uh, regulatory review. Next slide, please. <clears throat> okay. Under Section 4 of Rule 3, you know, um, as we, as I noted earlier, in a study conducted by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, the Philippines is suffering from a lack of formal uh, regulatory uh, reform, uh, re regulatory review management, that agencies are operating in silos as if they're an independent republic. Not true anymore in, in under this uh, present setup because agencies are supposed to be interconnected not only within their respective agency, but also uh, among all the other agencies. They have to be interconnected. Later on, once the central business portal is developed by the DICT, that will really be now given more emphasis. Uh, it will really be mandatory for all agencies to process uh, applications or requests using the digital platform. Dapat po online natal under the uh, new normal. The need to automate is no longer an option. The use of the digital platform is already the new normal. Uh, we, have done, we have noticed that when we do our banking transactions, we avoid physically going to the bank, we do it online. So agencies will now be providing for a digital platform that will accept applications online, process them online, uh, require payment of fees to be paid online, and uh, issuance of licenses, permits, etc. also online. Next slide, please. Oh, this is very important. Under Section 9 of the law and Rule 6, Section 1 of the Implementing Rules and uh, Regulations, the head of the office or agency shall all be primarily accountable, responsible for the implementation of the act. Therefore, if there's a violation of the uh, no lunch break policy or no cut-off policy, 
because they're saying na the uh, agents, uh, the employee processing it is absent or on lead or incompetent, the head of agency must be liable because the head of agency must provide for a backup. Dapat, uh, in case the responsible employee is absent or indisposed, there has to be somebody who will take over. Otherwise, he will be the subject of a complaint under uh, Section 9 of the Section 8 of the law. Even though it's a requirement of citizen charter, the head of agency is responsible for the submission of an updated uh, citizen charter. Next slide, please. The zero contact policy, I already discussed that earlier. No? Except only, you know, when he pays the application, when he submits the application and he pays the fees physically, other, except when it is being done online, no? for complex or highly technical transactions, yes, maybe. But the, if there's need to be a meeting, the meeting has to be recorded with the prior consent of the applicant. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, very important, what are considered uh, violations? No? Under Section 21, very specific for ang ating batas for uh, what are considered violations of the law. Uh, and violations and persons responsible, uh, what are those considered in violation? Refusal to accept application or request with complete requirements being submitted by the applicant without due cost. Meaning, pag nag well, applicant nandun before 5 o'clock, before end of office hour, sabi ng uh, employee, cut off na po, sorry, balik na lang the following day when the complainant files complaint before us. Surely, we will consider that a violation of the law. Another one, imposition of additional requirement not provided for in the citizen charter. Number three, imposition of additional cost not reflected in the citizen charter. D, or number four, failure to give the applicant or requesting party a written notice on the disapproval of the application or request. Five, failure to render the service within the standard processing time of 3720. F, failure to attend to the applicant prior to the end of the working hours or uh, even during lunch break. Six, or let G, failure or refusal to issue official receipt. And Lastly, but not, of course, the last, least, fixing and or collusion with fixers. Very specific po ang prohibition against uh, fixer. Because even if the violation is considered a first offense, but if the violation involves a fixer or has dealt with the fixer, the law provides for a steeper, steeper penalty of for the second offense. So, even if it is a first offense, if it involves a fixer or dealing with a fixer, the penalty for the second offense will apply. Okay, next slide, please. All right, uh, let's take a break. Sa panahon ngayon, hindi na pwedeng nakakalusot ang hindi isumusunod sa batas. Ang mga kalokohang ito, walang takas. Si Boss, mahigpit yan. Kaya tignan mo, unang pagkakamali pa lang, mabigat na ang parusa. Oo, oh, strike to ka pa. Aba, wala kang kadala-dala. Kaya lahat na nito, ipapataw sa'yo. Di ko sure sa'yo ha, ang akin lang, mag-isip-isip ka na. Si Boss, panalo yan. So, to put two strike policy uh, under section 22 of the law providing for penalties and uh, liabilities for the first offense administrative liability with six months suspension except when dealing with a fixer or inclusion with a fixer for the second offense to na dismissal from service disqualification from holding public office etc including uh, 
imprisonment of one to six years with a fine of 500,000 to 2 million. You know, when we do our lecture before government agencies, so you can imagine the fear of government uh, employees or officials when they hear about this, because when they be, when they'll be the subject of a complaint and if it's a second offense, there is perpetual disqualification from service and forfeiture of men. Uh, there's even a fine and imprisonment. So we mean business. Uh, the, the agency is serious about this. We will implement, we will enforce the law. Um, uh, once we receive the complaint, even if we do not receive the complaint, if there's a blatant uh, disregard of the law, we are empowered to investigate moto proprio and we can file uh, the necessary charges on our own. Ne next slide, please. Next slide. All right. Next slide. All right. Before we go to the streamlined process under uh, reg uh, regulation under administrative order number 20, there's a provision under section 11 of the law. Uh, uh, when you get your uh, uh, fire safety evaluation certificate, uh, uh, fire safety inspection certificate, or certificate of fire insurance, certificate when you file your insurance claim you will be sometimes you must have experience uh, difficulty dealing with the bureau of fire protection uh, they you're being given a run around you know the, what's funny about this law is that it provides for a specific penalty and violation under section 11 for the bureau of fire protection when they fail to issue the required certificate within the seven working day period. <clears throat> There's a specific penalty of imprisonment of one to six years and fine of 500,000 to two years. And there's also a specific provision which says that, um, let, let me go when I read this under section 11, uh, section 11 of the law, uh, uh, section 12, I mean, section 12 of the law, no? Um, it is prohibited uh, for the personnel of the Bureau of Fire Protection to offer selling you a fire extinguisher or other fire safety equipment in lieu of issuance of your certificate. Even if they do not specifically or uh, blatantly require that, they, if they would maybe uh, impliedly or uh, in passing, mentioned to you about uh, uh, selling a fire extinguisher or a fire safety equipment, uh, that is prohibited by law. And when you complain, <clears throat> there's a penalty of one to six years uh, imprisonment and 500,000 to 2 million uh, fine. There's also a provision for a uh, central business portal under section 13 of the law which uh, mandates the DICT to in consultation with the national privacy commission in terms of developing a system that will ensure that agencies are connected there will be data sharing uh, uh, applications will be accepted online so that once document is submitted to an agency and when that is required in another agency that another agent will no longer require the physical submission of the document because that should be made available online uh, by a particular by the first agency because agencies are supposed to be interconnected and uh, also uh, when a permit or application uh, requires uh, a homeowner's certification tonight yung mga telco towers uh, under the memorandum circular signed by no less than Secretary of Housing, he already uh, dispensed with or eliminated the requirement of a homeowner's uh, certification because really well, that is one of the major cause of delay. The homeowners would not give its consent. Under the law, the homeowners association is given only a period of 10 working days to refer the application to the members of the association. 
and the association is given a period of 30 non-extendable working days to give its consent or approval to the request. Or if it gives a disapproval, he, it is required to state the ground or reason for the disapproval or request. Failing this, this is also subject to automatic approval provision of the law. Now, under Section 9 of the law also, if your clearance request or application requires uh, a resolution from the Sangunian Bayan, Sangunian Lungsu Panusod, or Sangunian Panglaliwigan, that Sangunian is given a maximum period of 45 working days from the time the application is submitted to it, subject only to a one-time extension of 20 working days. If the Sangunian is not able to process that within that <clears throat> mandated period of law, a uh, period of time, the law says it is also subject to an automatic approval. However, if it denies the application or request, it is mandated to state the reason <clears throat> or ground for the denial of the application of the request. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> I already mentioned earlier the uh, administrative order number 23, series of 2020, where no less than the president, in addition to the mandate of ARTA and the Republic Act 11032, requiring all government agencies to submit its compliance report to the anti red tape authority within a period of 60 days. And that after one time extension, that period uh, expired on July 25. Uh, 2020, where it uh, uh, we issued a circular uh, for the agents to guide them in the submission of the compliance report. No? We required them to identify the um, kind of services that they offer to the public, the justification, the either the law or regulation as basis for that uh, service or requirement, and uh, to show uh, whether or not that is causing or just justified that that is not causing undue burden or cost to the public. Uh, the agency is also mandated to streamline their processes and procedure and to recommend the repeal or revision or amendment of the law or regulation that they are implementing if it is causing undue uh, regulatory burden or cost to the public. We were given a period of six months until July, January 25, uh, 2021, to submit our recommendation to the president, including recommendation to file charges against those agencies to which failed to streamline their processes and procedure, including their failure to submit to us their uh, most updated or uh, citizen charter. So that is how serious the president is. And that is how serious ARTA is. If you have any problem at all with any government agency that you're dealing with and that services that they're rendering are not disclosed in their citizens' charter or that they're imposing an additional requirement or fee on top of what is published in the citizens' charter, and if you find the law or regulation that they're imposing is burdensome or redundant, report it to us. We still have until. Uh, January 25, 2021, to make our recommendation, including the filing of charges against those responsible. But we are not waiting uh, for the January 25 deadline. As early as two weeks ago, we have already sent out uh, notices of warning to the agencies not in compliance with the uh, administrative order 2023. Uh, be because we thought that uh, due process requires that before we file charges, we just have to give them the proper warning first. So that's it. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Ito po yung, I already discussed the business one-stop shop, which will ensure that uh, uh, applications uh, requests will be processed under one roof. No? The law provides for a three-year period from the effectivity of law. But uh, in our meeting with the Secretary of uh, uh, DICT, uh, Secretary Unasa said that we will not wait for the three-year period to expire. He said within one and a half years, we will implement the law 
unfortunately because of the typhoon medyo there was some damage to their infrastructure uh, so we will expect a delay in the implementation but before the term of the president ends in 2022 we will assure you that uh, we shall be able to uh, fully implement the law already <clears throat> next slide please all right, next slide. The NEMA program. Uh, I mentioned this already. Uh, we have focused on the five uh, critical uh, sectors of the industry, and we are referring to the telco towers. The it's in the news, no? The shared towers uh, facilities to improve our connectivity, especially during this pandemic period, that there is really a need to improve uh, internet services. We can only do that once we um expedite the process of uh, uh, applications for setting up uh, telco towers we are really way behind vietnam in terms of uh, setting up of telco towers so we cannot complain if we are having poor interconnectivity or interconnect uh, uh, internet connections because we are very short in terms of uh, those uh, telco towers we're, we're doing doing our best we we it's part of the report uh, in terms of our improvement in the uh, telco tower. Another industry is the uh, socialized housing. Uh, we are also now in uh, due consultation with no less than the secretary, uh, Del Rosario of the housing, together with all the related agency. But of course, the food and pharma, we have uh, started already. With, that's the first agency that we dealt with in view of the pandemic uh, period in terms of the application for permits for um, uh, PPEs, yung mga vaccines, dapat importation of drugs and medicine. Uh, the, the reforms are being done in the food uh, and drug industry because this is our priority program under program Nehemiah. Also under my own, uh, I'm in charge of uh, the logistics and uh, in the uh, energy sector. Uh, uh, yesterday, we had our webinar with the U.S. Embassy on uh, ease of uh, delivering safe uh, food and agriculture products. We have several challenges in, the, uh, in it, but uh, our discussion is continuing uh, and uh, with the end in view of improving our uh, services to the public. You know, mga energy, there's a law, a separate uh, law for that. The EVOS, the Electronic uh, Virtual One-Stop Shop which is being handled by the Department of Energy. But even with the EVAS law, we are already in uh, co coordination. We have drafted a, an initial memorandum of agreement with the Department of Energy to assist the department in implementing uh, the law in terms of streamlined process, in terms of uh, re-engineering of their uh, systems and procedure to ensure uh, more efficient uh, um, processing of uh, application we have filed a complaint against uh, the bureau director for failure to act on the application for uh, permit to operate a renewable energy they failed to act on the application the, after more than two years so major uh, lull in the relationship major tampo in director but we're still of course that should not stop us because uh, we should not hesitate in filing cases if we find that there is really a violation of the law. So even when the director of the bureau in charge of uh, processing the application for renewable energy was uh, in close dealing with us because there was a complaint against them and there were sufficient evidence to sustain it, we had no alternative but to file charges against the bureau director and the uh, employee responsible for the processing of the application. Next slide, please. So, ito po, can you imagine uh, why we focus on the industries? No? To, just to get to set up your telco tower, you need to deal with at least 10 offices and you need to comply with at least 60 regulatory requirements. For the housing, you have to deal with 27 offices. I'm sure President Nena, if she's listening, she has problem with the Department of Housing. You have to secure 78 permits and you have to get at least 146 signatures and file your 373 documents. 
in the food of pharma food and pharma you have to deal with 27 offices and 195 regulations for power and energy 36 agencies and 476 those are logistics pag apply ka na certificate of public convenience you do not only deal with the ltfrb but but we deal with 22 other regulatory agencies and submission of many other documents next slide please so in view of that, uh, sa addressing the problem in the uh, Telco Tower, we have issued joint memorandum circular number one with the DICT. Uh, next slide, please. To improve on to to improve the processing time. So before the program ni Hamaya, uh, thirteen permits required, eighty six uh, documentary requires, and two hundred forty one days to process. After the issuance of this. Uh, uh, circular only eight permits required 35 documents to be submitted and within 16 days your application for permit or license will have to be approved and you see the percent the improvement from the screen next slide based on the study by the world bank it will uh, it will have a savings of uh, more than almost 600 million pesos Next slide. And in a report uh, uh, submitted to us as of uh, November 23, uh, 2020, the PLDT made a significant uh, improvement in terms of the release permits. 1,519 permits were released. Sa Globe, 967 permits. Those are compliance orders issued to LGUs. 60 we have issued because we have to call the attention of the local government, meaning the, either the provincial governor or the mayor concerned that uh, there is a pending application with them and that this has not been acted upon. So after we issue the compliance order, we see we saw already the uh, immediate result. No? So we received 25 compliance reports and we conducted uh, seven uh, summary hearings for that. Next slide. All right. On the... Uh, Logistics side, which is under my jurisdiction, the first thing that we did uh, to, uh, in view of the measures for the pandemic, uh, we no longer uh, allow people to file physically uh, the, for payment of their cost, customs duties uh, and charges, but they can do it online. Uh, before, kasi, before the meeting, uh, aside from the physical uh, online filing, they also have an option to do it online. Under Joint Circular Number 1, Series of 2020, uh, signed on August 5, 2020, the uh, filing of uh, application for customs, charges, and permits and fees have to be done online, and the processing have to be done also online, and the payment may also be done online, or should also be done online. Next slide. Ito yung, uh, agency, we, we, we made sure, no? So, yung sabi na ako kanina, we gathered all the agencies involved, the DTI, the Department of Transportation, the Philippine Ports Authority, the DILG, the DICT, and even Land Bank, and the Bureau of Customs, of course, together with all the private sectors concerned, the port operators. And so in record time, about two to three months, we were able to come up with the circle. Now we are expanding our initiative to, next slide, please. Tona. Uh, the logistics sector. For those of you in the trucking business, uh, you must be. Ito na, next slide, please. Tapos na tayo next slide. Okay, just to highlight, no. Um, in the logistics sector, you need to deal with at least twenty-four agencies. So you will you will have to suffer the pain of waiting for. Or, or complying with at least 209 steps or procedure and processing time of at least 271 days, almost a year. With the full implementation of the program NMI for logistics sector, it will only require you uh, 24 steps or processes and maximum of 35 days for your application for a certificate of public convenience to be issued by the Land Transportation Franchising Regulatory Board. Next slide. 
Based on the study by the World Bank also, if we fully implement program in my logistics sector, it will redound to a savings of almost 2 billion pesos. Next slide. Okay. Just to ensure also that agencies comply with uh, uh, the requirements even under the new normal uh, uh, requiring uh, uh, online processing of permits and applications, we have issued uh, uh, a circular on this, which was approved by the IATF, Interagency Tax Force. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. Can you go back to the logistics sector, Jeb? Di ba natin na mention doon, yung unified pass? All right. Wala, no? In the logistics sector, we have this initiative called the uh, unified logistics pass. Uh, if you notice, during the general quarantine period, where only authorized persons are allowed to leave their premises, there is this system developed by a group of um, private developers uh, uh, worldwide, no? Filipino uh, IT specialists. Uh, they came up with a, a process called a, a rapid pass, where only those issued with a rapid pass will be authorized to leave their premises so that when they get checked in a checkpoint, all they have to do is to present the rapid pass, which can be um, being done through the uh, yung RFID process nila, no? um, QR code. Now we are taking off from that. Um, we have this uh, uh, initiative wherein of the 24 agencies involved in the processing of certificate of public convenience, we have asked the LTFRB to be the root regulator. Uh, and that uh, the if you're a tracker or operator, all you need to do is submit a unified application form with the uh, uh, LTFRB and all the other agencies uh, will also be considered in terms of their documentary requirements so that the application will be processed one time by the LTFRB. And once the LTFRB issues the certificate of public convenience, together with that CPC is what we call a unified logistics pass that will be honored by all agencies that will allow a tracker operator to pass from the point of origin to the point of destination uh, unimpeded because it will be issued a unified logistics pass uh, uh, based on a UR, QR code based on the technology adapted in the um, uh, rapid pass system. So therefore, uh, those, uh, if you there are still go local government units requiring uh, pass-through fees, no? that is no longer allowed. There's a DILG circular, if you have report of this, any barangay, municipality, or city requiring a pass-through fee for delivery trucks, that is not allowed, not only under the local government code, not only under uh, circulars issued by the DILG as early as 2007. This has been updated in 2018, and the DILG which will come out with an updated circular re reminding local government units not to impose pass through fees because this is illegal under the law. If you have any report on that, if you have any personal knowledge on that, report it to us. We will call their attention, we will inform the DILG, and the DILG will file charges against that agency. Next slide, please. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide. Next slide. Uh, can, can you go back to the previous slide? Okay. This uh, circular uh, is a circular issued by the anti red tape authority and endorsed no less than by the uh, ISO Doing Business Advisory Council chaired by the Secretary of Trade to the Interagency Task Force. No? Uh, 
uh, on governments. And um, after getting its endorsement, we issued the circular. Next slide. Requiring that for uh, reduction of requirements for permits, licenses, and uh, uh, certifications, and to ensure that uh, uh, it's not clear. Yeah. Next slide, Nala. Can you go to the next slide? I guess this is not clear. Uh, the circular provides for a whole of government approach uh, in terms of getting your approval in record time, in terms of uh, yeah, automatic approval or extension, in terms of extended validity of at least three to five year period, and uh, expedited uh, renewal procedure. Okay, next slide, please. It's not clear. It also provides for interconnectivity among agencies, reminding then uh, data sharing among agencies and a provision for a uh, single window approach where the application is supposed to be processed under one window or one roof. Next slide, please. <clears throat> next, can you, next slide. Can you go back to the previous slide? All right, uh, just to emphasize, no, the mandate for agencies in the processing of permits and licenses is really for them to interconnect, to share this with other agencies, and to have a single window so that it will be more efficient for them to render services. It will be less burdensome for the applicant to deal with their agencies. Um, and the ultimate objective really is to follow the mandate under Republic Act 11032 to make it easier for people to deal with government for a more efficient delivery of government uh, services. Next slide. So as we always say in the end of our presentation, the reform train against red tape is now on the move. On it are the hopes of the people for a better Philippines. Anyone who chooses not to move will be run over. This is our mandate. It takes two to tango. We need your cooperation, participation, and support. Recently, we have uh, entered into a memorandum of agreement with the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which will assist us to receive complaints against a particular agency because the PCCI has offices nationwide. ARTA does not have yet. And for PCCI to process their this permit, these uh, complaints and to forward it to us if they do not, if the complaint is not filed directly with us. We have also issued a circular on the creation of an anti-red tape committee for each and every agency. We have issued that guidelines. All agencies are mandated to set up a committee on anti-red tape headed by no less than a responsible public official, the third highest ranking official of that agency. To ensure that Republic Act 11032 and all the initiatives are followed. To ensure also that complaints are properly addressed. If you have any complaint against that agency, you are supposed to go to their uh, Committee on Anti-Red Tape Unit, uh, Committee on Anti-Red Tape Unit. You're supposed to, get, to go to their complaints desk because all agencies are supposed to set up a complaints desk. If they do not have the complaints desk, then they are in violation of the law. So report it to us. We can only do so much with our limited resources. And we assure you that we will um, give due course to your complaint. Uh, anybody can file this complaint online. We are encouraging them to file their complaint with us online. We are encouraging them to tell us their concern. Of course, you see that uh, an improved service has been done by that agency. Let us know also because under Section 20 of the law, it provides for a report card survey, which is uh, kind of a feedback mechanism as a basis for giving an award, not only as a basis for imposing penalty on them, but also as a basis for the reward so that agencies will be encouraged to follow the law. 
Let me repeat, the law requires a change in the mindset of people and government. Gone are the days when, when you go to that agency, it is as if you're asking a favor from that agency. No longer true. It is our responsibility, our mandate, to render more efficient services to the public. If we cause, if we're causing any delay, if there's any red tape at all in any government agency, including local government units, please let us know. We will act on your complaint. That is our commitment. Next slide, please. So we end the presentation with uh, another uh, video presentation for a break, and then we will go to the open forum. Smarter initiatives, better Philippines. All right. Thank you very much. It was very informative, DDG Ness. Um, <laughs> I just realized that you have a very challenging task ahead, yeah. your office in general. Um, yeah. You are assured of our prayers and support, of course. But, um, you know, aside from learning a lot of things from what you said, no, I also realized that um, tama yung sinabi dun sa last part, no? Yung sinabi nyo, DDG Ness, a change in mindset. Uh, bumangon tayo sa bulok na sistema. You know, uh, Filipinos are either too shy to complain yeah. or they have this tendency to complain in Facebook and no one can actually see them. So it's yeah. good to know that there is already an active agency like the ARTA that can help the business sector by promoting transparency and accountability. 
Tama kayo, DDG Ness. It takes two to tango. Yeah. So the challenge is not only on your part, but also on our part, no? We have to be vigilant. We have to be proactive. Hindi pwedeng mahiya ka mag-complain. Otherwise, walang mangyayari. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, DDG Ness, I don't know if you can still uh, spare us a few minutes of your time sure. for some questions and answers. Um, sure, Bernie Thank you, thank you for that. Maraming salamat. Maraming po kami natutunan. First question, uh, how are complainants protected from possible retaliation from agencies? Yan po ang nakakatakot, DDG Ness. Aangal ka, baka balikan ka later on. That is the usual complaint that we receive. There's this hesitation. No? But you know, as I said, it really takes also, requires a change in mindset. Not only in the people in government, but also the, the, the people, the public, they have the right to complain. And, you know, they, they, we, we, of course, we understand that. No? But there are ways. Like, for instance, if they belong to an association, they can course the, the complaint through their association. Um, we can also investigate moto proprio, meaning, but of course, it will require some, uh, a, 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 well, a deeper, a more time for Arta to appreciate the complaint because nobody would like to uh, come out in the open. Uh, there are ways like oh, uh, coursing your complaint through an association uh, or your organization, or you can uh, file an anonymous complaint and Arta will uh, investigate Moto Proprio. But of course, we really do appreciate if uh, we get uh, an open complaint because one of the basic requirements for that, uh, for filing, is we. Uh, require a party to submit to us a sworn affidavit, of course, because uh, this will be filed with the ombudsman and uh, a requirement of the ombudsman is a sworn uh, mm -hmm. affidavit. Yeah, I think you're co very correct, uh, Dibuginez. It's about time for Filipinos yeah. to, to step up. Um, I think yeah, it's very uh, important. So, so yung, 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 Kiko, yung retaliation, kasi may provision naman for the second offense, eh. Yes. Okay, television, we, file, we have that person dismissed. Yeah. So it's a change in mindset. Uh, yeah. Another question here, DD Gines. Uh, has there been a government official? Uh, well, we, we, we heard that you have filed cases. No, it's a very young agency, but yeah. you know, meron na po bang na penalized by ARTA for violation of the law? Uh, we filed cases with the Ombudsman against a governor, against a mayor, against a barangay captains, against a councillor, reserve deeds. Uh, under secretaries, uh, bureau di of directors, we have filed, and we also issued automatic approval orders against yes. uh, thousands of them. Uh, actually, that's good to hear. So at least we know that um, you know. Hopefully, government offices will realize that um, mm. everyone must do their share. Yes. Uh, <laughs> from oh, this one is from Attorney Vic Ceballos. Okay. Uh, Attorney Vic is asking: Can PTR for lawyers and other professionals? be valid for five years instead of renewing it every year. <laughs> Uso na po, DD Guinness, passport yeah. years. Yes, like yes. Five. In the, ama, in the latest circular that we issued for all government, we really encourage them to uh, extend the validity of uh, uh, two, three to five years. M maybe that can be the subject of a discussion. If there's a proposal from an organization, uh, we can... Uh, um, uh, we are we, we have this organization close dealing with the national business permits and licensing office of uh, this are this is a nationwide organization perhaps we can make that representation and uh, we can make that request and uh, for the agency to to extend the validity period from not only from one year but also to three to five years yeah i i, I know that and understand it's good to hear thank you attorney vic yeah. uh my if you can file maybe we can email to us a, a proposal recommendation so that we can officially act on it. Uh, maybe through the, what, the IDP or the mm -hmm. alumni association can make a formal request so that we can we have, can make that as a basis or a step towards uh, uh, calling the agency concerned to I take think that tradition. Vic Ceballos will spearhead that. Thank you for yeah, that thank question, you. Attorney, Attorney Vic. Uh, this is from Madam Giselle. Does this cover also agencies under the judicial department or applicable only to agencies under the executive? Unfortunately, while the law did, does not provide only provide for agencies concerned, uh, in the implementing rules, we said that uh, only agencies in the executive agencies are covered. But 
in our discussion with the Supreme Court and in with the legislature, uh, they're also taking steps towards adoption of simplified process of procedure in the respective offices. Uh, in fact, there's some mga um, World Bank doing business report, my coordinate case with the Supreme Court administrator, he said that they will also set up their committee on uh, anti-red tape. Hopefully, they can do that uh, and follow the lead from it. And we're ready to assist them. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, next, we have a question from Philippine, Filipina, Filipina ako, Filipinas ko. Do you also inspect online procedures of the different agencies and check on ease of use? An example is when SEC shifted to online applications for business registrations. The portal was so difficult to use and really hard to understand that even mm. SEC personnel were complaining about the system, which defeats the purpose of making it easier for businesses to apply for registration. You know, if we receive a complaint like that, it's really difficult to cover all um, agencies nationwide. But if we get a tip from that, then that gives us a clue to start the investigation. But <clears throat> uh, as I to aid us in the, in the process, we have this compliance uh, uh, monitoring and enforcement office in the, in the entire the which uh, monitors the compliance of agencies in terms of their submission of their updated citizen charter. So uh, always when we receive a complaint, we always uh, uh, verify that from the citizen charter. And if that particular service is not reported in their citizen charter, or uh, if there's um, uh, you yeah, know, a problem, uh, on the online that is already in terms of application, uh, it's difficult to to discover that until we receive a complaint uh, as what uh, is being raised to us uh, right now. So if you can email to us your concern, then we will ask uh, SEC to uh, comment and there's a need to improve on it. Uh, recently, we received a Facebook complaint by a prominent lawyer uh, but when we ask for the details, he has not submitted the details to us. So when we call the attention of the SEC about it, they're also asking us for the details. So until yeah. we get the details, what particular service is concerned, that particular agency will not be able to act immediately the complaint. So the yeah, for reality. Yes, that's uh, right. Earlier, we also saw uh, messages of support to your office, DDGNS. At this point, I think we've exhausted, no? Uh, we'll be sending some of the questions by that email. Um, we posted the website of ARTA. Um, we hope that this can reach a lot of business enterprises, not just lawyers. Um, yes. Of course, the objective is not to encourage just people to complain, but to have everyone uh, change in mindset for the government officials to yeah. be more afraid. Uh, well, not, not that we're scaring them, no? But... Um, to be more proactive and for business enterprises to be more proactive. Maraming yes. salamat, DDGNES. We, we are praying for you and we wish you all the best, especially sa opisina po ninyo. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Maraming salamat po. Pleasure in mind to be of service, not only to the Ateneo community, but to our people as well. Anytime po, you can reach us through our website. Looking forward to further collaboration with you. Salamat. Thank you, DDGNS. Thank you. So before I end this program, uh, maraming salamat sa opisina. Thank you to the Office of the Anti-Red Tape Authority, uh, particularly Deputy General, uh, Deputy Director General Ness Perez. Thank you. Thank you. We've learned a lot. Before I end this program, I would like to reach out to the guests, students, and fellow lawyers in the Ateneo de Manila School of Law to help the ally, especially in this web lecture series. We expect to have two more lectures this December 2020. And uh, with the help of past and current ally directors, we have become a more engaging and progressive alumni association. Um, the ally's persistent efforts to decongest jails, provide legal assistance to those who have less in life these past years, are laudable and is worthy of your support. Alai has successfully sponsored 14 scholars, all of whom are now doing well in the practice of law, and there are four who are graduating this year. We are appealing to your generous hearts to 
to support the ally even by simply paying your yearly membership membership fees or the lifetime fees or by simply joining our activities and advocacies you can check our web page our facebook page join the ally by updating your juice and make a difference not just as lawyers but as persons who live for the greater glory of god again thank you to our speaker dgdgns and to all our sponsors without you this would not have been possible thank you and see you again soon Ateneo Law Alumni Association has evolved from its image of a boys club in the early years to the image of an active alumni association of men and women for others. I think it's very important to remember that the ally performs a very important education value. The education of our graduates ends not with graduation, but with their continuing practice in introduction into the legal world. This is a big task, but I believe everything is possible as long as you believe in our dear Lord. And as Athenian lawyers, we do believe, and with your help, we will be able to do it. Let us continue to be men and women for others. Join the Alliance. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us.